uh, to open up the State of the Mobile Net conference, this inaugural conference, we, we didn't want to assume we knew what the mobile net was, uh, frankly, because I, don't, I certainly don't think I do. And we didn't want to, since we are an internet-centric organization, we didn't want to assume that everything operates the same as it does on the internet. Um, so what we asked um, some well, three luminaries to do is come up and give an overview of how uh, the, the mobile net uh, uh, it has evolved, uh, is evolving, and, and will evolve. I was actually stunned by uh, Susan's comment that uh, a billion downloads from the App Store happened uh, just half an hour ago. That's just astounding. So things are happening at a very rapid pace, um, and what we wanted to do was kind of talk about the ecosystem, how it works, and not take any, anything for granted and not make any assumptions that we actually know how the mobile net works. So we asked um, three different folks uh, from, from a variety of different disciplines to, to give um, uh, their, their views on that very question. We first start off with uh, John Piha, who's the chief, chief technologist for the Federal Communications Commission. Uh, John is a, uh, is, uh, got his PhD at Carnegie Mellon, and we also have another Carnegie Mellon panel, panelist over there, uh, Dr. Laurie Craner. So very excited about having a lot of Carnegie Mellon folks here today. Um, John is on leave, uh, I guess, from Carnegie Mellon, is that right? Um, and um, got his uh, PhD from Stanford. So, uh, John is going to give us a brief overview of how the, the evolution of the mobile net. Then we're going to go to Director of uh, Services North America uh, for Nokia, uh, Andrew Elliott. Um, and Andrew is responsible for deploying its services, which are games, media messaging, music, and social location, which um, Susan actually mentioned was going to be very important to her as a troika of things the administration is going to focus on. Um, the interesting thing about um, uh, Andrew's bio, besides all of his uh, uh, education and awards, is that he's, they're working on transforming Nokia to an internet company, which I found pretty, pretty interesting. So we'll go to Andrew and then finish up with John Horrigan, who's a, a researcher uh, for Pew Internet and American Life Project. We've, uh, we've had a lot of different um, folks from Pew give presentations over the years for us. Um, and John is going to talk about how the user experience, how users view uh, and interact uh, with their, their mobile devices. So if I could, if I could just ask um, for your attention, John is going to give a brief presentation on uh, what is the mobile net. John? Uh, good afternoon. Uh, I'm John Piha, Chief Technologist at the FCC and a Professor of Engineering and Public Policy at Carnegie Mellon, as you've heard. Um, so let me start with the opinions expressed today are my own and do not reflect those of the Commission or the Chairman. Um, I, I was asked to come talk and in you know, 12 minutes tell you basically everything you could possibly want to know about mobile network technology, at least the wireless portion of it. You'll hear about the, the, the devices a little later uh, and some of the policy as well. Um, I said, you know, that 12 minutes, that would not be a problem, but um, I would point out that lots of people when I'm in my Carnegie Mellon role, you know, spent years of their lives and enormous sums of money to get the same information. So. Please don't pass this on to anyone. You'll put the university out of business. Um, if I do have to gloss over anything, I guess what I will uh, hope that I do is, is I'm supposed to lay a little uh, foundation so that further uh, the, the later more policy-oriented talks will make sense. So I will first talk a little about the technology, and then I'll try and say some of the implications that may matter in future sessions. So first of all, if you were going to build a wireless system, uh, one thing you might want to do is you know, put, a, put an antenna up on a tower or a, or a tall building and communicate with a bunch of devices. And every device will communicate directly to the tower, not with each other. Um, and you know, this works very well as long as everybody is close enough to that tower to communicate. But of course, if you want to go a little further, uh, what do you do? Well, you might, you know, put up a couple of towers or more towers. And I didn't show it, but run some wires between those towers. Those wires are going to matter. And uh, I'll have all the towers transmitting the same thing, same frequency, same content. And now I have found a way to cover a lot more ground. This is great. Um, and in fact, uh, actually, a lot of public safety systems work this way today. Um, but while this is a good way to cover a lot of ground, it has one little problem. Uh, I didn't increase my capacity any as I added more and more towers. Um, so in fact, the more I spread out, the, you know, the less uh, capacity per square mile, and this is not going to work for, for a big scaling up a big service. 
So it took the 70s and a little invention out of AT&T Bell Labs to figure out how to deal with that, and that is called the cellular architecture. Uh, cellular architecture, by the way, is not the same thing as cellular services. It is a cruel joke that that word now has two meanings that are very different, uh, designed to make engineers look you know, more, more intelligent because we know the jargon. Um, but the basic idea of the cellular architecture is I'm going to divide the world into cells and within each cell, uh, each cell will be served by one tower. It'll use some portion of the spectrum. And then some other cell can reuse that same spectrum. And now, all of a sudden, I can go through very large, conceivably unlimited areas with a fairly limited amount of spectrum. And that is the basis of an awful lot of systems since then, including cellular and not limiting to it. Um, Coverage, by the way, if I, so if I, if I want to serve, you know, I build infrastructure, a bunch of towers in my city, and I obviously want my, my uh, customers to work somewhere where I have no infrastructure, I establish something called a roaming agreement, which means we can sort of function as one system. Uh, probably you've all heard of roaming. Uh, one thing I just wanted to point out is that this requires me and that other provider to share information uh, with each other to make that work, both up front and in real time, probably. And that will matter later. I'll come back to that. So, uh, as, a, as a recovering engineering professor, I, uh, I stole a very old figure from, so sorry, it's a little awkward, but um, what you see at the bottom, those, those, those little hexagons, hex hexagons are supposed to represent cells, um, and you see information then you know, goes from those cells up to something which uh, was called a mobile switching center um, where a bunch of information is aggregated. You might have a bunch of those connected to each other and then eventually connected when this, when this diagram was made back to the, the uh, public telephone network. Ooh, um, today you might uh, have the internet in that picture as well. So for those of you who don't care about engineering pictures, what am I, why am I showing you this? This will tell you something about who the players are. Um, clearly, we need consumer devices, which you'll hear more about in the next talk. Um, within each of these cells, well, not quite each of these cells, but that's complicated, but more or less, these cells need towers. Uh, could be that, that a cellular provider owns towers, but actually there's an interesting trend these days. More and more towers are by a new kind of third party, or at least a growing kind of third party that leases out space on towers, and they are now an important part of the wireless ecosystem. Um, you also need backhaul. You need to connect information back somewhere. And again, the provider may do that itself, or that may be a new kind of entity that, is, that plays a role here. Um, these mobile switching centers uh, are probably run by the cellular provider, although today they may do all sorts of other things, or tomorrow they may do all sorts of other things that they didn't do before. This may be a place where some interesting services turn up or not. You actually may see those services showing up somewhere else, like outside in the internet, and where they show up is going uh, to matter. In the industry structure, it's going to matter to the services, it's going to matter for lots of stuff. All right, let me jump to spectrum a little bit. When we know what a cellular architecture is, what have we learned about spectrum? Um, first of all, cellular providers get licenses that grant exclusive rights to spectrum band in a given geographic region. Um, that's, there, there are lots of other ways to go. I will just mention, for example, systems such as Wi-Fi use unlicensed spectrum, which means anyone can use spectrum as long as they follow the FCC rules. Could talk a lot more about that, but for the short talk, I'm going to focus on the licensed side, which is where much of what is, I think, to follow happening. Um, so one thing you might wonder is, what does it mean for a cellular provider to run out of spectrum? It's something we hear a lot. Um, I don't actually entirely know. Uh, first of all, I say what it, what it is not. Spectrum is not consumed, as one might sometimes think. It's not like your cheesecake, you know, you eat it and it's gone. Um, spectrum does not get full, it's not a big jar, you know, you fill it to the top and there is no more room. What full spectrum is is actually a very hard thing for an engineer to define, but I do know what full capacity is, and that's usually what we mean. Um, so when a system runs out of capacity, you might say there is a problem. And what that means actually is going to depend on the application and the service. Uh, for a cellular voice system, for, for example, what it, a, system, a cell is at maximum capacity, what we mean is in the busiest hour that I care about, uh, the data rate in the cell is at its, is at its maximum that, this, that these particular transmitters can sustain too much of the time. Too much of the time might be 1% of the time. Why? Because that means 1% of the time, nobody else can get in and do anything, because it's already at maximum capacity for that 1% in that busy hour. 
Um, and when that happens, you know, providers and their customers uh, may get unhappy and they need to do something about it. So what do they do? Well, oh, first of all, uh, I'd note, you know, how does capacity get full? Well, it can get full if your number of subscribers increases. It can get full if the minutes of use per subscriber increases. And it can get full if the bits per second per subscriber minute increases. And of course, there are providers hard at work trying to make sure that all three of these things happen uh, at a rapid, as rapid a rate as they can figure out how to, how to, how to convince us. Um, so what do you do? Well, I mean, one thing you can do is you can try to use more efficient technology, uh, which I say is, a, I can talk a lot of, I'll put aside what that means, but a, it's a limited solution in that, you know, you can move up to the state of the art and maybe you get a 50% gain or a, you know, even a double your, but double your capacity, but you can't really get lots of capacity typically this way. Typically, you want lots more capacity because you're seeing broadband applications going through the roof. You get two main choices. One of them is you can, get, you can build much smaller cells, those cells I just showed you, uh, which means you need to build a lot more towers, and that means you need money. All right, so this is, this is uh, uh, a, a cost issue. A different approach is to get more spectrum. So one thing to note is that there is this trade-off between spectrum and cost. When we say we need more, spe more, more spectrum, you might be, it might be equivalent to saying, it would be costly for me to build a whole bunch more towers without more spectrum, and I'd like to have lower costs and therefore lower prices. How do you get more spectrum? Um, from the, if you, you, can, you can either go to a regulator, uh, and if in theory, you know, spectrum, some spectrum is given out first come, first serve, if there's no contention, it's probably not gonna to apply to the kind of spectrum we're talking about where there is contention. Uh, otherwise, for the most part, it's auctions for this kind of spectrum, and as we've seen, auctions can, uh, those, those prices can go high. Um, there are a few other ways of dealing with spectrum. Uh, satellites, for example, are different, but I won't, I won't get into that. Um, and note that oh, the regulator, for, obviously for this to happen, has to have spectrum to release, which means it has to clear some. It's not like you can you know, find new spectrum that no one ever thought of, uh, unless you're going way, way up in the high frequencies. Um, the other way you can get more spectrum is from another license holder. Um, and from that I can say, all right, you've got this license for the next 10 years, can I pay you for the right to use it for the next five years or five months or five minutes, what, whatever I can work out. Um, and for that I need an active secondary market, which is a, another sort of policy issue. Um, sorry, so just a few things that may matter, matter as, as, we, as you break out and think about other stuff. Uh, first, I'd point out that the, there are multiple types of firms involved in providing wireless services, some of which are obvious to all of us and some of which are kind of hidden from the typical consumer. Also, that multiple firms may know something about users, who they are, what they do, et cetera, in the normal course of business, and I think there's a session on privacy that may matter. Um, I would note that new services might emerge in different places, by which I really mean the, the equipment in different places, which means the control in different places. Some may be more linked to what the cellular provider is doing. Some may be outside in the internet, uh, and that is going to have business and policy implications. And I believe you'll be talking about some of those new, new services and, and, and cloud computing and other things, I believe, is a, is a coming session. And the cellular, cellular architecture means that Spectrum can support many users, although not for free. Right? So for example, if high data rate applications become popular, providers are probably going to be either investing in infrastructure, you know, putting money into this, or acquiring more Spectrum, or some combination of those. And also, some of the mechanisms I talked about of freeing Spectrum or secondary markets may matter. So I will stop there, thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Andrew Elliott, and as I was introduced, um, I'm responsible for launching services in North America for Nokia, which may seem like a bit of an oxymoron given that most of us have more affiliation with Nokia as a company as probably one of the first mobile phones that you've had, hopefully. Um, and um, I guess there's a, 
I don't have any prepared slides, which again is kind of an unusual thing coming from anybody that's, if you're from Nokia knows that the way that we operate as a company is through PowerPoint slides. So I'm really out of my element here in terms of what I'm going to be doing this afternoon. So I hope you can all bear with me. Um, I've entitled my speech or comments really about life is a pattern of circles and I'll introduce a few circles that uh, I'll talk about, I actually uh, plagiarized this name from a, uh, a former ambassador to Luxembourg who I had the, the fortune of meeting through a friend of mine a long time ago. Uh, but in any event, the first circle is the biggest one, uh, at least for me personally. Uh, 46 years ago on this day, my mother gave birth to me. So, uh, <laughs> I wasn't looking for an applause, I'm just trying to create some circle scenarios here, but that's one of them. Uh, but there's certain examples of things that have gone on in my life that, I'll, that I actually do draw back to, to the, uh, you know, the, really the topic at hand here, which is the mobile internet. Um, and with that, I will say the mobile internet, at least in terms of, uh, you know, what it is and how to describe it is, is you know, I think, that is probably not the right way to describe it, is what I will say, is because the internet or the things that you experience and the services that you wanna participate on, whether it's in your living room, whether it's in front of a computer, whether it's at work, or whether it's where you're walking around during the course of a day or in a car or on a commute, that's, that's, that's your experience, that's your life and how you tap into that through those experiences is it shouldn't matter. There shouldn't be barriers to say this is the mobile internet and this is the internet I experience in front of my PC or some other way. So all these things, this is convergence. This is, this is you know, things are happening all around us that we tap into one way or another. So fortunately, Nokia as a company uh, has realized this a long time ago. So why would even Nokia be up here talking about the, the mobile internet? For, for a variety of reasons, I think it's kind of, uh, if it's interesting and it's actually practical. So it's practical in the sense because, you know, uh, probably about 30 some odd years ago, when they started to make standards around what these mobile networks would be, these cellular networks, uh, Nokia was there and had a play, had a role in defining what should be an open standard as it relates to that so that we could see the, the, the evolution of the networks that we have today. Uh, and quite frankly, it's probably evolving at a faster pace than PCs uh, have. So you see these curves occur on a regular basis. But anyway, Nokia as a company has been around for quite some time, whether it was uh, initially starting to create paper products, which is what the humble beginnings of the company were, they transformed into a rubber company, um, making cables, boots, uh, to the point where they're at today, which is, you know, we're trying to figure out if we're gonna be able to break through in the services arena, uh, whether it's in the mobile space or not, it doesn't, you know, I don't think it really matters to us. Uh, the conduit by which we will do that is obviously through, through the devices that everybody has in their pockets today, which is a mobile phone. Um, anyway, the company recognized that, and uh, through, through the course of the last five years, which is about the amount of time that I've been fortunate enough to be at the company, we've made a series of, I think, very intelligent moves, um, and you know, we're just now starting to see the, uh, the fruit being born from, from some of those efforts. And we do this in across a couple of areas, which, you know, I'm only providing you a lens of how this looks from a Nokia perspective, because as you get into these further discussions here today, it's probably gonna spark it in other ways. The relevance to you might be a little bit different, but from a Nokia perspective, we're looking at trying to do so uh, through these five services. These five services areas are in games, they're in messaging, they are in music, they are in what we call social location and media. Social location is just kind of a, uh, it's a new twist to uh, the location-based services, basically. Um, you know, the personal navigation market is a $20 billion a year industry globally. 
Um, and the fact that the mobile in space is quickly catching up to it is a pretty astounding thing to think about. Um, music is another interesting one. Uh, one, because it gives me an opportunity to tell you another story about my, a, a life as a pattern of circles, uh, and also just because of some interesting things that are developing in that space. So let me start with the uh, pattern of circle one. So I was born 46 years ago, but my grandfather was born much longer time ago than that. Uh, he actually was a crooner in a big band called the Don Bester's Orchestra. Uh, it was a fan, they, did, they were one of the first bands to ever sell a million records. My grandmother and my grandfather one day decided to go watch a movie. It was a Gene Autry movie. And the folks over there in the copyright office are gonna appreciate this one, who I had the pleasure of sitting with at lunch. Another small circle. Um, they were watching the movie. Gene Autry's riding a horse across stage singing a song. It's the exact same song my grandfather, as a singer in the band, was, was very, was, became well known for. Um, unfortunately, my grandfather did not see one single dime from uh, the royalties that we see today associated with how that music is done. So I think it's kind of interesting that today now, I'm sitting here looking at how we're going to potentially launch a music service here in North America, dealing with, uh, in particular, DRM or non-DRM issues as it relates to that particular industry. So that's a pretty fascinating thing, at least for me on a personal level to participate on. Uh, another one is uh, just in the messaging area. Of course, uh, it was noted that uh, our, our newly elected president has a BlackBerry, it's fantastic. I'm sorry, it's just not one of our new QWERTY devices that we're gonna be launching with uh, AT&T shortly here, which you'll hear about. Um, but anyway, maybe we can convince him to do that. If with some of your all's help, maybe you can help me do that. In any event, uh, we've acquired this company called Oz, Oz Communications, and they've been uh, working with every single one of the mobile operators, very, very much so here in North America. Uh, and it's likely you've probably encountered the use of that application on your device in some form or another. In any event, um, what might seem like a pretty stale piece of business here in North America, because we're all running around with QWERTY touch devices, is not necessarily the case in the other parts of the world. In fact, we're launching some of our messaging services in other parts of the world, acting in essence as an ISP, akin to what you might find through Google Mail or uh, AOL, Hotmail, et cetera. We're actually seeing that people are now registering on our service at a faster rate than all of those other com companies combined, uh, in particular throughout Southeast Asia. So it's interesting, uh, I wish I was a part of this on some level, but some consumers first experience with the internet is through a mobile device, in particular messaging, uh, which I think is pretty interesting. Uh, we've got a whole unit dedicated to looking at how we can create applications now in these, in, in these emerging markets that have absolutely nothing to do with the mainstream of what we encounter here on a daily basis things that you would never think that they do. I mean, it's incredible, I mean, to talk to some of these cultural anthropologists and the things that they do to understand what happens in the day in the life of somebody in an emerging market is, is something that um, we, uh, we tend to take for granted here. Uh, social location I'll just touch on. We acquired a company called Navtech a while ago uh, for a hefty sum of money. And it's starting to pay off, I guess, and now at this point where we're seeing the, uh, the run rates and growth uh, occur globally at faster rates than, than, uh, than, than the personal navigation and in-car in, in navigation markets themselves. Uh, it's about a $5 billion a year industry. Uh, and then uh, this one last one I'll just mention is in the media space. So it's quite uh, common today to be a, a purveyor of your own application store. And of course, Nokia is no different in that regard. We're, we're happy and delighted to say that we're going to have a, uh, an application store available for all of you to participate in next month. Um, but there was a discussion about scale, and I think that's, you know, um, it's interesting to, to, to look at uh, Nokia as a company in terms of its scale, because the devices that all of you are probably walking around with are probably uh, high-end devices, smartphone devices. And uh, at Nokia, what's interesting is to see that 
you know, we've got a wide range of devices that we have. We probably launch about 40 different devices to 50 different devices every year. We ship about a million units every day across that spectrum of different types of devices. So we've learned a lot in the, in the process of doing that. Um, but as, as we turn on and make available this application store, I was just in a conversation yesterday as we were looking at how we were gonna launch that. But the global numbers are coming in at a level that uh, we'll probably have 250 million people hitting that application store when it goes live within the first month. So it's wonderful to be able to see that and at least open, you know, at least share the concept of that fact that we're not just bringing stuff together from a high-end perspective, but we're also now seeing that we have an ability through very simple browser technology that's made available in these devices, which we consider entry level, having access to all these wonderful things that, uh, that you all have had an access to for, for quite some time on your high-end devices. So it's kind of interesting how that's beginning to pan out. And we'll probably in the next year as well begin to see also the GPS chipsets into, uh, into these mobile devices here shortly as well, which means bringing navigation to, to entry level devices as well at a very affordable price point. So um, with that, I'll just close as my uh, final uh, circle uh, comment here, which is that, uh, you know, it's been a, a, a fascinating journey for myself personally being in the technology field. I first became involved with it when I was uh, working on a PC in graduate school and I uh, formatted my friend's hard drive by accident and uh, <laughs> Uh, fortunately, they've learned to forgive me from that point forward, but uh, I've, I've, I've since become involved in, uh, in working with uh, computers for quite some time, and now to see the power of what I thought was an incredibly high-end PC when I first started working for a software company in the palm of my hand now is just a fascinating thing. I thought it was great to have a 386 with 8 megs of RAM on it. And uh, I think any one of the devices that I use today are far faster and far more robust in terms of the functionality and capabilities of what I have an ability to do today. And uh, look forward to seeing the future of other advancements that are made, not only on the hardware set, but with some of the services that we're making available. And not just because we're launching them with devices, but we wanna launch them with devices and enable other developers to spawn greater creativity than just these core services that we're talking about delivering. So, thank you. Thanks very much. Um, my name is John Horrigan. I'm with the Pew Internet and American Life Project. And I'm gonna um, get going here with a few comments on where users fit into the mobile ecosystem. I'm told that we may have Senator Thune uh, coming with us uh, very shortly, so I may uh, get off the ground with my discussion and turn the podium over to Senator Thune and then uh, come back and uh, have some additional comments. But uh, what I wanna do is talk about where users fit in the mobile ecosystem. At the Pew Internet Project, we do lots of national random digit dial telephone surveys that look at how people interface with information technology. And uh, just to get going, what I'd like to do is uh, today is contrast a little bit adoption patterns of the mobile internet with the adoption of the desktop internet from the 1990s. It's tempting perhaps to see the mobile internet as having adoption patterns similar to the desktop internet. However, uh, when you look at the data, um, that's not quite the case and it has some interesting implications. Before I get to that, I wanna um, point out though that um, People who use um, mobile services, um, for the vast majority of these services, people who adopt the mobile internet are basically transferring their habits from the desktop to mobile. We don't see uh, very much evidence of people doing away with broadband at home in favor of uh, mobile wireless. Uh, the vast majority of people using the mobile internet already have internet access at home and mostly have broadband access at home. We also, in our data, don't see very much data of people adopting the internet de novo with wireless. So again, it's usually for, for most people a migration from the desktop to mobile, with mobile being an add-on for people. Um, 
as we've looked at the desktop internet adoption over the years, we found that people have a wide range of uses uh, for using the internet. Some are into um, information gathering, some are in for basic uh, communications functions, and others are into content sharing. So there are different thrusts of behavior for users um, when they're using the desktop internet, and it's not surprising to see some of that show up when we think about the mobile internet. And to sort of explain that a little bit better, I want to talk for a moment about a survey that we did that resulted in a typology of information technology users. It's a report that we published about a month ago called uh, The Mobile Difference, which categorized people into different segments based on what we call the three A's. Assets, what kinds of gadgetry they have, actions, what they do with their various information services and gadgets, and their attitudes, what they think about where uh, the internet and mobile devices fit into their lives. And a key finding from that report is that we found that 39% of adult Americans fit into five different categories that we char characterized as motivated by mobility. These five different categories of users were people who really get mobile device usage, they like it, they don't mind having the intrusion of the cell phone uh, when it rings or when it beeps with um, a text message or an email. But again, there were five different groups in this motivated by mobility set of users, and again, there were different thrusts of usage. Um, one group uh, we call the digital c collaborators was essentially the power users. These are the people who are, um, have the most gear, are doing the most with their information technology. So um, this group would be the Twitterocracy, uh, the people uh, constantly using Twitter. I think we can add um, to transformative wordplay on Twitter as part of our um, bingo for, for today's sessions. So these digital co collaborators are the power users. We did find other user types with other thrusts in their behavioral usage. We found one group that was very much into sharing content. We found another group that was very much into social networking and accessing the mobile net for entertainment purposes. We found one group that um, sort of used traditional tools of texting and email to manage the, uh, the, the, the logistics of their lives, and we found a fifth group that we called the mobile newbies, which were older Americans who were kind of new to having cell phone service, but really liked how um, cell phone service makes them more available to others, and they could be uh, possibly drawn into uh, more deep digital engagement as they gain more experience with their mobile device. So this range of user behaviors of these very engaged 39% of uh, the mobile population uh, leads to the first lesson I want to leave you with today, which is in the mobile ecosystem, there is no set profile of the lead user. Rather, there are a number of different, number of different kinds of lead users in the mobile ecosystem. And I'm sensing that we have um, lesson one is a good place to just interrupt. Lesson one, and we'll get to lesson two and three in a couple minutes. Thanks a lot, Tim. I sort of feel like the, the pregame show and the postgame show for uh, <laughs> Senator Thune's very interesting remarks. And uh, some of what I'm going to get to later on in my, my remarks actually dovetail uh, very nicely with some of the issues that Senator Thune raised. So without further ado, let's um, move on to lessons two and three and, and some of the implications from them. So lesson one, just to review, I used to teach, so I um, am always reviewing for students. Um, lesson one, there is no set profile of the lead user in the mo mobile ecosystem. Rather, there are a number of different kinds of users. And moving to uh, the second lesson um, has to do with talking about the demographic characteristics of engaged mobile users. And again, and here I want to draw a comparison with the desktop era of internet adoption. If you look at active desktop early adopters of the internet circa 1998, they were young, but they really weren't youthful. The, the median age of the active desktop internet adopter uh, in 1998 was 38 years old. Um, that person tended to be a, a white male, um, if, if you sort of picture um, 
a guy uh, sitting behind his big clunky monitor anxiously waiting for the modem to connect. Um, maybe, maybe he had a boom box off in the corner with the Eagles Greatest Hits playing. Um, that's your early adopter for the internet uh, about 1998. Mobile's different. In a study we did last year, um, we found that um, active mobile internet users are young and very ethnically diverse. Um, we asked people about 10 different non-voice data applications that they might do on their cell phone. And on a typical day, 31% of Americans were doing one of those 10 applications. It could be texting, emailing, uh, downloading music, that sort of thing. The median age of that active mobile user is 32, so much younger than our guy from 1998. Um, it, this uh, active mobile user is also very ethnically diverse. In fact, um, African Americans or Hispanics are more likely to be doing a mobile application on a typical day than white Americans. So this leads to lesson two. Active users of the mobile net are younger and more ethnically diverse than their forebears uh, uh, from the desktop era. So from lessons one and two, we're describing a very diverse ecosystem. Uh, people do a variety of things, and the demographic profile is much more diverse than it was for the desktop era. So let's turn to the third lesson I want to talk about, and that's wh whether um, I want us to think about the prospect of the mo mobile ecosystem becoming the dominant metaphor for the overall digital ecosystem. You recall earlier I talked about our typology of users that um, is built around uh, mobile in many respects, and I said that 39% of adult Americans are motivated by mobility. So what about the other 61%? In our typology, we called that group the um, stationary media majority, and that 61% of adult Americans sorted into uh, several different groups. 14% of those Americans are off the grid, meaning they have neither internet access nor cell phone access. The remaining groups, which is almost half of the adult population, actually have a fair amount of technology at their disposal. The vast majority of cell phones, the mass, vast majority have internet access. 60% of that group has broadband at home, so they're fairly wired up, but they, they simply haven't gotten the memo about the mobile revolution. Um, and attitude is the key differentiator here. They tend um, uh, not to like being intruded upon by the cell phone, and their attitude about always available connectivity has actually deteriorated over time. So this leads to lesson three, which is even though the mobile internet appears to be the hard charging next thing in the digital world, and it clearly is, there is nonetheless a sizable portion of the population that may be slow adopters of mobile applications. Let me um, finish up with a couple of implications that come from these three lessons. And the first implication comes from the final lesson, and that is simply that moving to mobile won't serve all users. So if you're designing e-government applications, if you're designing um, telehealth um, applications, um, yes, it's important to uh, serve that highly engaged mobile population, but you're gonna have to design for a lot of people who are still accustomed to desktop access to the internet. The second implication has to do with the youth and diversity of leading edge mobile users, and this Diversity has important implications for innovation. If you believe that diversity helps foster creativity and that creativity helps foster innovation, then the patterns of adoption really mean very good and exciting things for the innovation system as a whole. But what do we do, need to do to further cultivate that environment? I think it's important to recognize that openness is certainly a value when you look at the behavior of mobile users. And even though the market um, may well uh, be enough of a force to foster openness in innovation on wireless platforms, I think it's clear, clearly an implication of um, when you look at user behavior that all actors in the mobile ecosystem uh, have a stake in maintaining an environment that is open to innovation in this space. 
The sizable group of mobile enthusiasts also has implications for cloud computing. I know we're going to hear about cloud computing a little bit uh, later today. And cloud computing isn't inherently or, or necessarily about mobile, but certainly the increased access um, because of mobile makes cloud computing applications a lot more attractive to people. This means that people are going to increasingly store personal information online, whether it's financial or whether it's about their uh, social networks. And this, in turn, places a premium on tools that people should have to manage their uh, personal information online. We haven't seen a whole lot of privacy scares thus far, but just a few could undermine people's confidence in the mobile internet. So another implication is that it is crucially important to make sure that users have the proper tools to manage their personal information. And with that, I think I will conclude and uh, having gone through my three lessons and uh, three implications with a break in between, um, I'll turn the microphone back over to Tim. Thank you very much. Thank you, John, John, and Andrew. Thank you so much. I think we have time for uh, maybe one or two questions, and I have one um, pressing question of my own I'd like to ask. So if any questions um, out there for the panelists? Ma'am, I think there's a wireless microphone right here, and God willing, it'll work. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Diane Steinauer from NTIA. I had a question to Mr. Horrigan about the rise of the phenomena of netbook usage, and wondering if you're tracking that. I'm a recent convert for that for travel purposes. Thank you. Is this on? Yep. Is this on now? Yes. OK, thanks. Um, questions about netbook access. We have a survey in the field currently that is scheduled to come out of the field within the next week or so that will ask people about um, netbook usage. Um, and the overall thrust of the survey is not only to update our numbers on broadband adoption, but tr to try to really dig into the different access points people have uh, with high-speed connections. So we're looking at the netbook, netbook and uh, mobile laptop uh, type of applications in, in addition to the handheld. So we'll have data on that within the next month or so. So lesson four in the next month or so. And do we have questions? The, the question that I had uh, that really is terrifying me is what uh, Andrew said in his opening comments was, um, I wouldn't have called it the state of the mobile net conference. And um, so do we, in, in response to that, do we, do we have to change the name of the conference? And was this the wrong way to frame this entire thing? Yeah, <laughs> and I think I think the question is, um, and, and John hinted at this was we're we're seeing a lot of convergence, and we're not sure whether it's going to go the net. Uh, as Susan Crawford had said, we're going to uh, handheld computers, or are we going to more mobile devices? And and it's hard to figure out, and it's kind of scary if you kind of build something called the State of the Mobile, mobile Net Conference. Um, <laughs> what, what what the future of the conference looks like? Yeah, I, I didn't mean to uh, suggest anybody incorrectly named anything here. I'm just, <laughs> I, I think it's, uh, it's easy for us to want to kind of compartmentalize and categorize things. And I think just access as one thing, uh, you know, is ubiquitous, at least, uh, at least in the densely populated urban areas. The senator was kind enough to point out as well that we don't have that in rural areas. And it's, it's improving, but it's definitely not where it needs to be. But that aside, you have a backbone, you have the cloud out there that exists, and everybody can tap into it one way or another, whether it's via satellite with your TV, whether it's cable, whether it's a DSL connection, whether it's a mobile phone, whether it's a netbook. It doesn't, it, it doesn't matter what the device is on the front end. I think, you know, I'm, I'm only representing one view as to how we tap into that. But these devices today, you know, they have Wi-Fi and they have cellular connections. So it's, um, and, and to the point that was made uh, from John was that what people do on the internet is the same thing that they do on the mobile phone. It's just, you know, it's brought to life through a different network path at the end of the day. Dr. Pia? Um, I think it's a great question and we're gonna have to watch. Uh, I mean, there have been applications that have emerged in one place and not the other. You know, there's text messaging, for example, based on SMS. 
Um, we see some things that look like there is convergence going on and more and more applications may, may, you know, these may become different aspects of the same network or perhaps we'll see some of the providers who have the ability and, and the interest will develop applications on one of these platforms and not the other if they see a competitive advantage. Um, it's going to be an interesting couple of years. It was also interesting what uh, uh, Susan Crawford had said about one of her, I think one of the three focuses that she was going to focus on was location, which I found pretty interesting. Um, could, maybe five years from now, could we, the, the State of the Mobile Net Conference be um, about nothing but um, location and hyper-location information, meaning um, would that be the one distinguishing characteristic from the devices, or maybe 10 years from now, the one distinguishing characteristic that distinguishes mobile from uh, something else, hyper-location at any given moment in time in a contemporal setting? I think, I think it's an eerie thought on one level. Um, it, eerie only, and it's, it's, it's uh, I was reading a Wired Magazine article a while ago, and they were talking about GPS, and this guy just was like t using all these GPS-enabled applications, and then all of a sudden, you know, you know, and, and these, these devices can, can do that, you know, they can, I can share my presence to everybody, my exact location, and I share that with friends, and sometimes I share them with friends that I might not want to be with, but the guy that was the author of this article described how he made his presence known, and he was sitting down to have dinner, and two people that are part of his friend's network came down and joined him at dinner. Well, he didn't want to have dinner with them, and it was for somehow it seemed like it was an invitation to them just because he broadcast his presence uh, to do that. But anyway, that aside, I mean, I think that, uh, <laughs> you know, you, that's probably an eerie way to look at it. I mean, for me as a father now of two children, I would want to know where my you know, where my kids are. And I think it's an important thing to have that kind of context. And But even aside from those two extremes, I think in between you have this element of where I'm at and what I'm doing now has an impact on what's coming in and out of, of me, either through this device and, and what I interact with. And, and you're starting to see that already happen today through these friend finder applications, through purchasing applications that exist now. Uh, we're also actually incorporating that into our, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a key part of our strategy moving forward to use context as an enabler for how services come to life for an individual and how they choose to come, you know, go in and out of these different services in more ways than you would ever think how they mesh up. It's just, it's fascinating. John? Yeah, just to follow up on some of the points Andrew just made. We talk a lot about, and I talked about, uh, giving users tools to manage personal privacy and data and the like. But when you start to talk about geolocation, uh, the little anecdote Andrew just told about uh, the person coming to dinner that wasn't invited, um, we have to start to think about what are users' obligations in this space about appropriate behavior. Um, and I think that's a conversation worth trying to get going among policymakers and, and thought leaders. And by you know, user obligations, I don't just mean you know being quiet in the quiet car, but I also refer to the fact that you know Facebook changed its uh, rules of governance uh, a month or so ago, and there was a big outcry, and people are now uh, voting, or I guess the voting probably has closed on uh, some of the governance rules uh, on Facebook. But as people start to become uh, people should start to become more aware of their obligations to more proactively participate in, in some of these debates. And I think it's uh, something that elite users have done for a long time, but I think the discussion has to be more uh, broadly based uh, as we get to things like you know, geolocation and the like going, going forward. And doctor, you get the last word. Um, I think, I mean, in part we're talking about policies and in part we're talking about business strategies and, and governments, but in, in large part, actually, you're talking about social norms that haven't caught up with the technology and we'll all have to figure that out as we go along. Well, I, for one, am looking forward to having you all back for the 10th annual State of the Mobile Net Conference, and <laughs> hopefully we won't have to change the name. And, but I want to thank the panelists. It was a fantastic opening framing panel about what is the mobile net. I, we, I pre appreciate it. Um, the next two sessions, uh, cloud computing and infrastructure, are down the hall in Columbia A and B. And let's give a warm round of applause to the panel. Thank you.